volts to one volt, 50 to one step down in the converter, and what, it, what is that going to be? You know, 0 0.2, 0 0.02, 2 percent duty ratio. Okay, and still you add the two megahertz frequency, but that's okay because you can turn on and off in 10 nanoseconds and so on. Well, you're forgetting one thing. Um, look at the uh, uh, diode in a MOSFET, a uh, diode in a, uh, in a back converter. If it is 50 volt input and you have one volt output, that synchronous rectifier MOSFET or a diode there sees 50 volts. Actually, because it has a hard switching, there is no soft switching on the back. You have, a, with the spikes you have to, and margin, you have to use 100 volt devices. And you're delivering what? You're delivering 100 amps. So that, uh, that carries a full power, that MOSFET carries full power at 90%. 98% of duty ratio carries the 100 amps of a current, so all the power is in that MOSFET, and you're delivering 1 volt 100 amps. You're delivering 100 watts, and you're using 10 kilowatt converter. You know, I call that overkill factor of 100, right? And these people who are making gallium nitride as a devices, they, uh, they talk about figure of merit, how great is the figure of merit of gallium nitride versus the uh, silicon, etc. I agree 100% with it, and I even know better way to use gallium nitride than they do. But the problem is nobody talks about uh, figure of merit for uh, converters. Is this a good figure of merit that you're 100 times over killing in the power? And I had explained it to one of the companies, there are 330 companies in the U.S. In a, all making synchronous rectifier back, about $10 billion business. And one of them, I talked to them, I won't tell the CEO or CTO of their company, they said, Dr. Chuk, but we are not, use, we are not uh, taking the 10 kilowatt for that. She says, of course not, but you're buying a switch which is capable of 10 kilowatt and using it for 100 watt, right? Okay, so that's another point. So tremendous overkill factor, the voltage is 100 volts instead of a 2 volts, compared to another converter. The current is 100 amp, and that's another point. How do you switch in that current with that inductor? That inductor is not only bad because of air gap, but it's bad because it looks like a current source, and when you have a current source, what happens? You know, you have a, a turning on in 100 amps and turning off in 100 amps. How good is that? Layout at 2 megahertz, you know, all the th talk about it. I don't need that. You know, what about if my synchronous rectifier diode or diode as I showed on the right hand side, it has a half sine wave. Starts at zero, goes to peak, and it comes down to zero. You're turning on, uh, 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 turning on a diode at zero current and turning it off at zero current. And only when, it, when the diode knows that it is switching is in between. But at the moment, instance of switching doesn't even know that it's going to be a switch. You know what I'm saying? So layout and all the problems notwithstanding. And a voltage is two volts. I have a configuration when the voltage is equal to the output voltage. In this case, at 50%, and of course, I operate at 50% duty ratio in this converter, which is um, actually a take on a, on a for, um, tap inductor, but it is not because it has three switches. And therefore, it has capacitance in series, and that allows circulating current. That capacitance in series, by the way, is also protection. You know what happens when main uh, top switch uh, get shorted if it fails short. Well, you're using 10 watt uh, VRM regulator to drive the you know 800 uh, dollar <laughs> uh, Microsoft uh, I mean uh, microprocessor, and you're killing the microprocessor because suddenly you're going to see 12 volt instead of 1 volt. In this case, the capacitor in series is automatic protection because the capacitor in series and the output capacitor for the capacitive divider, and that is actually can be designed to set. Even if the input switch fails short and it's turned on, well, the output will see just uh, a ratio of the two capacitance, which is uh, one volt or less, okay? But anyway, these are side issues. So the point is, uh, this configuration, not only uh, these are problems with the buck, and these are no problems with the, what I call it, chuck buck two. I kind of came up with that, that name because originally I have another converter, isolate converter, which is a, I call a chuck buck, and then uh, I need to give it a different name. So have you ever heard for a city called the Timbuktu? I turned out it was actually capital of Mali, all right? But anyway, so, so when I'm uh, coming, this is comp my conclusion after 40 years in this field, okay? I, I wish I came up with this, uh, you know, 20 years ago, and, but uh, maybe the industry will be still uh, even more uh, responsive to it. But what's happened? I'm looking at 
left-hand side, back converter, legacy. And uh, PWM and all resonant and quasi-resonant methods that you're using on it, it looks like an inverted building. It's sitting on a back converter at the bottom and has a next layer of flyback and forward. Above that is a phase shifted full, br full bridge, and phase shifted full bridge. Then you have a resonant uh, type of converters and, uh, and uh, LLC converter, which I always consider like whoever really proposed to uh, kill the beautiful uh, transformer in a full bridge and make out of it LLC converter, which instead of having 1% magnetizing current, has a 200% uh, uh, twice as high as uh, input and output current. That's not a transformer. That's a misnomer, you know. Okay. Anyway, so on the right hand side, you see uh, what, I, what I showed here on the right hand side is new system. What we need now is not just new topologies. Even layer before that is a new switching methods, but not the resonant that we are using now, which allows that the current to go through zero and goes through several cycles, and then you have uh, problems how to control it, uh, switching frequency, changing relative to resonant frequency, and so on. No, my three methods that I utilize, they're all of course, they are all capable of changing the uh, regulating output, changing the frequency with respect to resonant frequency. But more important, I can use a constant switching frequency, design uh, resonance when I wanted to, and change the output voltage and regulate with a duty ratio change. And there are three methods. One is a, what I call it hybrid switching. Half, one switching interval on time, say, is a, like PWM. Off time is just a half resonant, half cycle sinusoidal resonant. The other method is a, uh, what I call storageless, because it has two resonances. It doesn't store anything. It's a, and then the third method is optimum, which is a little bit ahead of what, what I'm ready to talk uh, this time. Next layer is a non isolated converters, which now have uh, two resonant inductances. And these resonant inductances are 100 times smaller than your PWM inductor. And what happens? I can use, actually, for these resonant inductances, at 50 kilohertz, I can use one turn. I don't even have to make coil with the 10 turns. One turn, all I need is 25 to 50 nanohertz inductance, which I can get for a single turn, you know, a piece of wire. And two uh, resonant inductance like that give me the basically uh, very st large step down, um, uh, eliminate switching losses, you know, beats a buck, uh, you know, any time. And, and provides a large step down if you wanted to. All right, so now uh, here is a forward and full bridge converters. I just mentioned the problems, and you'll find out uh, that, uh, you know, uh, for example, forward output uh, switches uh, di diode on output side has to be three or four times higher voltage rating than the DC voltage that they are outputting. On input, the same thing. Input switches have to be two or three. Why? Because that uh, so-called, uh, on a back converter, you have this um, um, voltage clamp. Voltage clamp is really like having a secondary flyback converter on which you don't draw any load. So basically, it uses forward converter, uses a flyback reset. And with that, has all the problems of the flyback, OK? So that's why you have a high voltage uh, rating of switches on input, high on the output. But what we really want, we want to have a switches on the primary to have no higher voltage rating than input voltage under any condition. And the same thing for the output. And it's possible, and I have it. But I'm not going to talk today about it. OK, uh, what is this other one? The other one is a uh, full bridge converter, again, uh, shown here. And uh, now uh, let me uh, go. Uh, one thing that I, uh, when I came up with this converter, everybody was shooting and, and my converter and said, oh, it's bad because it has a capacitor. In fact, many people said it won't work because capacitor is in series with the input. So how could the DC on input uh, transfer to the output? Well. Capacitor there is not uh, in series. It is uh, as a circuit with the switches, it looks like it's serious, but when you take into account switching, the diode, when it's turned on, capacitance is charging, so it is actually in parallel because the left hand side of capacitor, right hand side of capacitor grounded. When you turn the main switch on, then the voltage on a, on a capacitor uh, turns off the diode, and now you have positive side grounded, so it's always in parallel. You know? so, and it has only two switches. Now, uh, what I uh, looked at that is, uh, if, if you see here, uh, this is a configuration with the isolation transformer. This is the only converter which has a single-ended uh, configuration of a transformer. 
because what it takes, just split this capacitor into two in series and throw in one-to-one -one tensor ratio transformer. So basically it operates isolated or non-isolated, operates just the same way. What happens with a, a full bridge? To make a, a full bridge out of the buck to put a transformer, you need four switches. It changes operation. To regulate it, you need a dead time and you know all kinds of problems. So now I put a, this isolation transformer and that's an isolated version. Now, um, 40 years anniversary was, uh, you know, April 1st, 1975. I was in a hospital having a surgery on my knee. That's why I'm crippled now. So they took my meniscus. And um, that's when I came up with a converter. You know, I had nothing to do for three days. So a uh, couple of inductors, integral magnetics uh, came shortly afterwards. I'm uh, really uh, happy to report that my new uh, methods, switching methods, and my new converters, they all can utilize full advantage of a couple inductors in magnetics, that's number one. And number two, the state space averaging, which I invented and introduced to this field 40 years ago, 40 plus, right, in 1975. Uh, state space averaging equally applies to this hybrid switching and, uh, um, and storageless switching. It doesn't apply to all these quasi-resonant, resonant, and NLC converter, but because they are deficient anyway, so I don't think uh, I have a reason to really uh, find the methods to analyze them because I don't think they, they will have a future. So uh, then we go next. Well, I'll skip all this. You can read it later from uh, this, and uh, because we don't have a time broad, you know, talking about this. Now I'm going to talk about a special uh, objective of how to make uh, uh, one big problem with the electric car is um, a battery charger. And it's not going to take off uh, and replace a gasoline engine until we solve the range anxiety problem. And the range anxiety problem won't be changed until we are able to put a 25, 40, 60 kilowatt uh, converter inside the uh, car. Here is an example of a um, 25 kilowatt um, a Nissan that uses basically a 60 hertz uh, or 50 hertz transformer, three phase, rectifying it and, and then charging this. You can see it's uh, as big as a, as a car itself, so there's no way that it can be on board. And, and uh, rapid charging is also in question. So now, this is how the, presently we do the PFC conversion. We put a full bridge rectifier, and um, yeah, by the way, you see, you put an AC source in, uh, in uh, floating, and you use a bridge, so-called Gratz rectifier, to essentially uh, get rectified voltage from inputs, uh, sine wave to get rectified voltage. And with the boost converter, you follow the, um, make a, a control that uh, input current is uh, uh, proportional to input voltage, so you have unity power factor by definition, okay? Um, well, here it is how presently we make a single phase charger. That's another problem of a present technology. What is it? The problem is that all the conventional technology based on a buck and so on, not only have a problem because of buck inductor that I just described, but everything buck derived is we are uh, thinking uh, very, uh, how you say, in a simplified uh, manner. In order to get AC to DC, we use uh, three blocks, four diodes to rectify it, follow with the boost, with the PFC, and then we get a high voltage DC, 400 volts, and then after that we need a converter to provide isolation, and here is this famous uh, full bridge, uh, phase shifted or not phase shifted, okay? So you have a total of 14 switches, and the phase shifted kind of helps with the switching losses, but then on the other hand, it doesn't help with the transformer, because for a part of a cycle, it basically you are uh, sorting the uh, primary winding, you're conducting, a, you're not delivering power, and you're having a current circulating in, uh, inside the transformer, which is never good. So, uh, full bridge, uh, flat comparison at uh, 100 kilohertz and 300 millitesla, low frequency ferrite material. But now when you go operate at uh, uh, 1 megahertz and 300, uh, thir uh, at 1 megahertz, you have on the same core, you have 3 millitesla, and you need that at high frequency ferrite because you can't take a more loss. But is there any difference in the size reduction? 10 times higher frequency, 10 times reduced, uh, increase the flux. So zero effect on the size of magnetics. But extra core losses in uh, one megahertz, an extra skin effect, as I said. So now, what is a better way of doing it? Let's 
forget about uh, block uh, cascaded connection, uh, rectifier, PFC converter, full bridge. If each one is uh, even 95% efficient, well, you know what? When you multiply all the losses in all three, it's going to be below 90%. How about making a converter which uh, is direct AC to DC, uh, which has some other additional advantages? Um, what is the paradox? I want to talk about that for a second. A long time ago, I looked at it and said, something, we are doing something wrong in the power electronics. Fundamentally wrong, because look at it here, Tesla motor, induction motor, and whether it's a synchronous with a permanent magnet, and neodymium, whatever, or whether it's an induction motor with a wound, uh, uh, short uh, winding rotor, it is operating at 1.5 kilohertz, and it is 200 kilowatts, this big, only at 1.5 kilohertz. And what you need to do is to feed that motor with the DC to AC inverter to make a variable frequency at 1.5 kilohertz, you operate at 150 kilohertz, 100 times more, and that inverter is a box which is two or three times bigger than the motor itself, right? And it has its own losses, 95, 96%. So basically, we have, uh, we are not using, and that, there is a reason for it. You know, we're not using it correctly. And especially if you want to have this situation uh, drive, which is isolated, and that would be nice to have it isolated. Why? Because you're not stuck with 110 or 220 volts. You can, through the turns ratio of a transformer, a high frequency transformer, you can go to 800 volts or 1200 volts and make a motor with uh, less copper losses and more efficient, right? So that's the paradox. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know if you can read this. Uh, this man tells his cat, he says, never ever think outside of the box, right? And I just showed you that what we really need to do is, just like this cat, we have to think inside the box, you know, to put the charger inside the converter, okay? And that is, you know, um, what, when I started talking about this about um, before Thanksgiving last year, and I was uh, using some of this concept that I showed you here, and, uh, but then, uh, what is about improvement factor? That's another thing that everybody's going to jump at me and say, uh, oh, you are dreaming. You know, how can you? <laughs> Everybody in, uh, in engineering thinks about we are improving something 20% and so on. And every, engineers think, OK, I can improve something, but then I'm going to destroy the other performance feature. So it's like a trade-off. I say, no. If you invent something which really makes sense, then you're going to solve all the problems at the same time. And that's exactly what happened in some uh, technology